Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. Um, this is sort of a humbling experience. I've, uh, most of you should know a little bit about me because I have literally no experience in search marketing. So I hope that I can say something that's, that's at least valuable. But um, spent the last seven or eight years working with a local startup called uh, MediaForge. Um, I ran sales and client services there for uh, that duration. We sold the business in 2012 to a company called Linkshare, which is owned by a larger Japanese-based organization called Rakuten. Um, but by show of hands, how many people have ever heard of Rakuten before? <laughs> oh, that's a surprising amount. Good. So they're probably um, the biggest brand that you've never heard of, at least in most audiences you'd have the opportunity to say that. but. Um, the obligatory bit here to sort of just educate the marketplace, um, they're the third, Rakuten, we are the third largest e-commerce business in the world behind uh, Amazon and eBay. Um, making investments globally in a, in a variety of technologies, um, significant investor in Pinterest, um, recently acquired other technologies like uh, Viber um, and um, a uh, San Francisco-based company called Slice, which is an app. But um, quickly rising the ranks uh, with some of the initiatives that we have digitally with aspirations of becoming the world's largest internet services company. Um, so as part of Rakuten, what we've recently launched is a marketing technology and services division called Rakuten Marketing. The composition of such is as indicated here. Domestically, the reason that this is important, hopefully to most of you here in the room, is that um, we offer a variety of, of channel services and technologies, but more importantly, um, this piece that we picked up. We just purchased a company out of the UK called DC Storm, which is an attribution business. Um, and I, hopefully some of the insights that we've gathered during that process will be um, insightful to you. But I wanted to start by um, pointing out the obvious that this is a very complex, complicated landscape, right? Most of us spend most of our day thinking about one small segment of a very dynamic, complex marketing mix. Um, and it's hard. So we're, you know, for the most part, little kids just trying to act smart all the time. Um, I should also let you know that I'm not a statistician. <laughs> I'm not a data scientist. I was a, a race coach, a ski racing coach before I took this job. Um, and so I've been this guy for the last little while. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that most of us, most of our advertisers anyway, have a very limited perspective as to what's really impacting um, their business. So. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, all of us are trying to give them some additional perspective and understand really what's happening. So let me just walk you through very, very quickly how we're going about doing this. Um, most of our advertisers view uh, channel siloed reporting, and they understand where they're having some success. But of course, as part of this um, intelligence gathering initiative, we want to mash that up and gain greater insights, right? You couple that with things like uh, cross-device insights or learning or offline data, this can become a pretty complicated um, process. So let me show you just briefly how we're doing this. Um, keep in mind, too, as context that most of our advertisers are in the retail space. So I'm going to give you uh, one example of one purchase um, to help you understand how our search team, which is based in Tampa, by the way, um, is making smarter marketing choices because of the insights that we're gathering. So I'm going to walk you through this one purchase so that you understand really what's going on. Um, here you can see that this is an order. This is an order that I pulled just recently from one of our participating um, clients. But uh, for the amount of $169, you can see the date and time of that order. Um, we're recognizing that this user is a, a repeat customer, so not a new customer. That's important for a couple of reasons, because every advertiser wants um, new customers, right? But they also want them to convert and drive lifetime value. So creating some distinction there is pretty important. Um, it's a, it was a phone order, turns out, but we're tying that to online digital touch points. 
And here you can see that we've effectively identified 28 touches over a 104-day period, right? So you give that one order to a CMO or an advertiser and ask them to figure out um, what created that behavior, and it's, uh, it creates a lot of discussion points. So now think at scale what you would be able to do if you had this data both for converting and non-converting consumer journeys across every, across every consumer that you ever reached, right? Um, it can become actually quite actionable. So um, you can see, of course, here the distinction between the touch point types as well as um, a distinction between branded and non-branded search events. So um, this can be quite helpful in discussions about um, search optimization, for example. I want to point out, though, um, and Joe, I, I'm going to have to thank you for some of the things you said because there's a whole piece in here about running that you're about to hear. And marathon running, as a matter of fact. But um, for better or for worse, most of our advertisers have a limited view as to what's really impacting their business. Um, and the, uh, I want to be careful how I say this. Joe and I are frenemies for the most part, right? So Rakuten is um, um, a client of, of Adobe. Um, but we're now mashing up marketing technology and services the same way Adobe is. So some interesting things here. But um, most of our advertisers, because they're now using site analytics tools or um, have falsely adopted ad servers to give them marketing insights, are probably giving credit unfairly to conversions that are happening, right? Staring at a system that leads them to believe that, market, that email, for example, is the only thing driving this conversion. So nobody shout it out. I hope somebody knows who that person is. But raise your hand if you know who that is. Oh, come on. There's got to be somebody. You do? Nope. I don't think so. I hope it's not. If it is, I'm really embarrassed right now. <laughs> this, uh, this woman ran the Boston Marathon in 1980. Her name was Rosie Ruiz. <laughs> Somebody want to tell me what they, if they know anything about her? Go ahead. <laughs> she took the subway. That's right. <laughs> That, that's right. <laughs> so this is an interesting analogy, I think, because when you think about giving credit where credit is due, um, you'd like to give it somebody that did the, to, to somebody that actually did the work, right? Um, it's funny when you start to research this person a little bit because um, they weren't really sure whether or not they should take the, um, the prize or the title away from her or not. But they did some investigating, and sure enough, she had cheated took the subway, waited for everybody to sort of get over there in two hours and however many minutes she did it in. Um, and then she just like snuck back in and <laughs> passed everybody. And now I don't know how many marathon runners you know are really successful, but at the time this was the third fastest marathon finish by a woman ever. <laughs> right? Um, so a week after she had finished this marathon, this is not my analogy. I can't take credit for it. I wish it could, but it's not. So that's okay. Like, get that out of the way. But a week after the marathon, they finally pinned her down and um, they tested her resting heart rate. And it was uh, 76. And um, the average rested heart rate of a marathon runner is under 50 for context, <laughs> right? So my suggestion to you is that all of us behave um, not like her, <laughs> but that we actually do the work, that we figure out what's um, creating effect, and then do more of that on behalf of our advertisers. But for better or for worse, um, advertisers have effectively trained ad vendors to behave just like this woman. So again, 
our advertisers are liking, likely staring at data that's a little bit misleading. So I don't want to get too much into this, um, but there's lots of ways to give credit to marketing touch points depending on um, how much data you have. But for example, let's say for just a moment that you had an opportunity to provide your advertisers with insights that helped them understand whether or not you were influencing consumers further up the funnel for whatever desired action, retail or not, right? And distribute credit where credit may be deserved, actually. So I'm going to show you um, how we're doing this a little bit to be smarter at marketing. So the topic was data-driven marketing, right? In my, is that accurate? OK. Um, so let me back up a bit. Most of our advertisers, most of you, um, are making, I think there's a little laser thing here. This is geeky, but let's try it. I've never used this before. But most of you are operating with a view something like that, right? Or maybe you are seeing the click events that you're happening from your search campaigns, but you don't know anything else about what's happening in between those clicks, right? Um, so this is what the, we're providing our search team and our display team and our um, affiliate team and all of our marketing services with so that they can go to their advertisers and say, hey, look, I want you to understand that I know that I'm the best search vendor for you because I'm operating with a comprehensive view of all of your marketing initiatives. And I know how my program is not just impacting the uh, in a silo, but how it's influencing or impacting or creating lift across all of your channels. And that's important to understand. So we also have the opportunity to explore um, optimization tactics related to new versus repeat customers. So as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, new customer acquisition is very important, but retaining those customers and uh, creating loyalty between those brands is also very important. So when you think about making a meaningful change to your marketing mix, think about how long you would have to wait to see if that's creating a desired outcome if you had full insights into this, right? Most of our advertisers think, oh yeah, my consumers, they convert really quickly, two, three, four days. More often than not, we'll turn on some of this technology and um, demonstrate to our advertisers that their consumers are taking 30 or 40 or 50 days. But some of these hasty marketing choices that we make or that our advertisers make, pulling budgets, yanking this, turning that on, turning this off, don't make any sense unless you have this kind of view. So most of our advertisers, most of you understand what's converting. Many of you understand what's creating new customers, but very few of us have any idea what's happening in between. So the degree to which we want to understand that is sort of up to you. But I would suggest to this group that there's also an important distinction that we want to make between solicited and non-solicited media events. So my roots are in display media, um, and that's different than search marketing for this reason, really, right? Somebody does a search, they're essentially asking for information about a product or service, for the most part. Um, and that's not necessarily the case with banner ads, for example. So if you wanted to understand whether or not your search efforts are impacting their other channels, we need to make... Um, a concerted effort to better understand this. So beyond the chronological order of, of marketing touch points or the sequence of marketing events that happen before or uh, that lead up to a conversion or a non-converting event as it may be, is important to understand. So um, anybody watch HBO? No? Online. Print publications have struggled to attract advertisers, partly because traditional banner ads are so ineffective that one study found we only intentionally click on them less than two-tenths of one percent of the time. <laughs> Which actually sounds about right. Because did you know that if you ever actually click on a banner ad, you literally get taken to a page that reads, Hey, is everything okay? <laughs> I'm presuming you passed out and hit your head on the keyboard. I'm calling an ambulance right now. Okay, so 
I, may, I hope you get my, the point <laughs> I'm trying to make, right? But building a display business is a little different than, say, building a business around solicited marketing touch points. So for uh, the display portion of Rakuten Marketing, we focus on a, some slightly different views of whether or not display media is actually succeeding. So here you can see an example of one of our most recent ads. It's a New Balance ad. Some navigational content, cool video. It feels like a miniature website, right? Very engaging to a consumer, at least hopefully. Um, so now, if we understand that users don't have a predisposition to click through banner ads, and that if more than 80% of all banner ad clicks come from fewer than 8% of internet users today, which is true, by the way, then we need a different mechanism to understand whether or not influence is being created through banner ads themselves. The reason I'm saying this to you is because there are implications to search. Um, but other things to think about here too. Um, I was actually very happy to hear, saw some news yesterday, Joe. I can't remember what it was, but um, an Adobe-related release around viewability, I think, something like that. But all of these things become really important. So um, the other problem that we have is multi-tab browsing. Right? So nobody's got a browser open that's only got one tab in it, right? So um, what I wanted to point out is that these display events in this sequence of events, the value that we're attributing to these display events are all modified based on the depth of engagement that we've been able to measure with the consumer. What did they do at the ad? Did they scroll through products? How engaged are they? And how should we modify the value that's distributed based on that depth of engagement. More importantly, at least for this group at least, understanding how that level of engagement creates or doesn't create subsequent behavior, say, with um, a search could be meaningful. Um, and there are implications across all the channels, of course. So um, I know we're running out of time now. I just wanted to mention a couple of different things because, um, well, let me ask a question to the group. When you're working with your advertisers, do you get into um, conversations about channel overlap and whether or not that's good or bad or how costly it is? Does that ever happen to you? No? Sometimes? All right, well, it happens to us all the time, mostly because we're in performance marketing. Um, and they're, like, they're constantly trying to tear apart these channels and manage them differently, which seems to be a little bit problematic. But um, just a couple of insights that we pulled just recently. Um, in July, we looked at uh, 34 million users, 3.2 million site visits, 166,000 purchases. This is just a small sample, nothing compared to what Adobe has, for example. But you can see that there are, um, there's improved performance when there is channel overlap. So when we weren't able to recognize a marketing event, consumers con converted at roughly 2.7%. That jumped to 3.4 with one, 5.2 with two, and over 20% when there was three or more. So I'm not sure there's a marketing manager in the world that wouldn't want that. Now it's our opportunity and job to just demonstrate to them how costly it is and do the net benefits outweigh the cost. So um, one other piece here, and this is specific to display and affiliate, but I thought this was quite insightful when we think about um, the importance of second site sessions. So um, another sample here, 111 million users, but we saw that uh, second site visit rates or return visit rates went from 20 with display, 13 from affiliate. And when, when there was overlap between the two channels, more than half of that audience had a second site session within this time period. But that's pretty powerful. Um, similarly, conversion rates went fr from seven and two to 16. So if you're having a conversation with your advertisers about whether or not they want to convert 16% of half of their site abandoners, <laughs> um, that becomes you know, a pretty powerful dialogue, especially if it's fueled with the data itself. So in our world, um, this is less about measurement and more about media modeling, figuring out how to turn some of these cross-channel insights into um, better results for our advertisers. So um, I want to rewind just a little bit and remind you just generally of what the Rakuten Marketing Value Proposition is. 
and that is that um, our search team now, like I said, they're in Tampa, is using the same value proposition that our display team is and the same value proposition that our affiliate program is, et cetera. And that is that we can be the very best because now we're making marketing choices with comprehensive cross-channel insights. The reason I bring that up is because it's driving results. So a couple of case studies here. Um, and I don't work with the search team, so, but this is what they delivered to me. But they've been able to identify new strategies because of these cross-channel insights. And um, through analyzing the data for one of our large luxury retail clients have driven significant year-over-year -year growth. That data is listed here quarterly. Um, this is another uh, example. So one of the things that they're doing based on the input of that data is changing bids multiple times throughout the day across the entire account based on the performance to find an optimal bid to drive lift, decrease in efficiency. So using the cross-channel insights we saw with this particular account, clicks rose 12%, conversion rates up 20%, uh, cost per click was mostly flat, and revenue on ad spend up um, 16%. Now keep in mind that that's not revenue on ad spend measured only inside of search. That's revenue on ad spend that's essentially been distributed based on the cross-channel insights themselves. The last case study here, um, just one more example. So sales growth 21%, the profit up 52%, spend up um, just 9%. But these are marketing results that I think um, are driven by data that um, nobody's really been providing them today. So um, this is tough. This is a complex ecosystem. There's not a one-size-fits-all um, way to do this. Um, every segment behaves differently. Sometimes there's winners, sometimes there's losers. You just have to sort of take it on the chin when it's your fault and get better. Um, and that's the message that we're sending uh, to advertisers around the world. Um, so that's Rakuten Marketing, that's what we're up to. Those are some of the data and insights that we've been gathering. Um, thank you for your time.